Welcome, everybody. I am so pleased to be part of this very special installment of our Ready to Learn series, which is Unbound Ed's opportunity to speak directly to all the members of our educational community about your issues of greatest concern and importance. I extend this welcome on behalf of all of the staff at Unbound Ed and our CEO, Lacey Robinson. My name is Gail Perry Ryder. I'm the Senior Director at Unbound Ed of Research and Design. And you might remember our previous ELA and math focused panel event. Well, today's program is our very first Leadership Power Hour. And we're gonna focus on the expressed ideas and issues brought to us by our school and district and central office leaders all across the country. So considering the conditions and constraints that students and families are under right now, educators and leaders are under right now, you can imagine all of the things that we're hearing about constantly from, from our constituents and thinking about with you. So today we hope to leave you with some good ideas and some information, but also definitely some inspiration. Thank you for joining us. I have the privilege of moderating this discussion between two leaders who between them bring four decades of combined educational leadership experience in schools, districts, and nonprofit organizations. We're gonna focus particular attention today on their decades of work as school building leaders who led systems and teams through the challenges that are built into those roles already, and have some expertise about doing that even within the context of challenging times. So this is gonna be good. We're right now in the middle of the worst public health crisis we've faced in this generation, and yet are seeing a resurfacing of some familiar simmering problems of racism and state violence. So our nation's students and schools, as always, are smack in the middle of all of it. System leaders are having to address new problems and at the same time come up with different solutions for some of the same problems. Our community members are telling us all about these and looking for support. So today we hope to be able to give you some of that. I'd like to introduce our two esteemed panelists. First is Lakeisha Covert. Hi, Lakeisha. <laughs> Lakeisha has a career spanning over 20 years as a K through five teacher academic dean and principal in Maryland, DC, and Virginia. She's certified in mentoring school leaders and coaches and builds professional learning opportunities for them all while being a doctoral candidate who is investigating leadership styles and their roles in creating mindful schools. She's designed content and practice sessions for schools and district leaders with an emphasis on achieving equity and standards instruction and effective implementation strategies. She's won numerous awards and attributes her passion for this all to her personal and professional background in education. She used to work at New Leaders previously, facilitating across the country on various topics related to leadership. But currently, we are fortunate enough to have her bring all of this to bear on her role as executive director of our Standards Institute, which most of you know as our most well-known signature offering for teachers and leaders. So Lakeisha, thank you for participating today. We also have Andrea Hancock, who is also a career educator with work spanning over 20 years serving Baltimore City Public Schools, the district where she proudly hails and was educated in her formative years. She too has served as an elementary school teacher, instructional coach, principal, and eventually a district administrator who supervised principals and instructional leaders across a network of pre-K through eight schools. Formerly, she led the Baltimore Division of Emerging Leaders Program, the Emerging Leaders Program at New Leaders, and she served as an advisor for the Transforming Teams Program. She's also the author of the recent blog article on adaptive leadership that published by Unbound Ed recently. And in it are some really critically important lessons about the nature of leadership when embedded inside of a complex system, i.e. a school. She holds a Master of Arts in Education from the University of Maryland at Baltimore County. And she's currently delivering all of her experience and knowledge here at Unbound Ed as Deputy Chief Academic Officer, where she contributes to our thought leadership, she manages our external partnerships, and ELA and math teams development of content work. Thank you, Andrea, for coming. Thank you, Gail. So I thought that it would be interesting to start this conversation by putting forward to both of you some quotes to consider from leaders and scholars in leadership out there. Um, 
So I ask that you would just share your thoughts on the statement that I'm going to give you and the relevance you think it has for leaders today in this context and drawing from your own experience um, leading a school. Is that okay with you? Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay. So Andrea, why don't you go first? And Joel Zollner says to us, there is no recipe for successful leadership. It all depends on who you are, where you are, what you do, and how you do it. What do you have to say? I agree. Um, leadership to me is a, not a destination, but a journey. And so it depends on the situation. You have to have different styles of leadership and be able to adapt to meet the needs of the people that you're supporting as you're leading. So if you're in a building and a school and the fire alarm rings, that's a decide and announce. We don't have time to make, bring everybody together to get the consensus. Should we leave the building? No, we're gonna leave the building. Versus a situation where we're trying to adopt a curriculum where we want consensus and input, not only from the people within our building, but our stakeholders as parents, communities, even the students that will, the curriculum will serve. So I agree, it is about, leadership is about making decisions along the way and empowering people also on your team to make decisions, but with delegation constraints. So that people have an opportunity to grow in their leadership as you continue to push them forward and build their capacity. So leadership's not static. Uh, it's, it's fluid and it's adaptive. Uh, do you think that those are the leaders that have the most success during crisis? I do, I do. I really believe that if you are a leader during a crisis, you have to be able, as a, as a principal, when I was in a school building, I remember making at upwards of hundreds of decisions within an hour. On the moment, you have to be able to adjust and respond to whatever is occurring so that you can make sure that you're delivering the best opportunity at that particular time. Did we always get it right? Absolutely not. And I talk a little bit about that in the blog on times when you have the best intent, but the impact doesn't quite land in the same way. The leaders who are stagnant are the leaders who are rigid. And when you don't have an opportunity to change and build different perspective, you stay in the status quo. Wow. Let's just talk for a second about that point about people who are rigid. Um, well, what if you do, if, if that's your leadership style, it's autocratic, it's, it's managing in one way, top down, and it has worked, so to speak, for a system up until the point of crisis. Um, what do you recommend for people working with a leader like that who see opportunity, who see possibility in the crisis, who have hope for perhaps a change that can meet this, the crisis where, where people need the most help, but the leader um, isn't the one that sees it that way, perhaps the people around the leader do. How do you uh, recommend that people would work around a leader in a situation like that where the leader themselves may not be the one who's able to be flexible or, or be open or be fluid? Absolutely. I think the data tells the story. So as a part of a collective community, if you want to bring something to the leader, make sure that you have the information that you need to support your claim. This is an opportunity for people to manage up and to give impact in a situation in which the leader may not see it. We all have blind spots. So even a rigid leader, if presented with the appropriate information in an appropriate way, may be willing to change their lens. And I really wanna emphasize the appropriate way. A lot of times we have great ideas, but the way in which they come across may not be most desirable, and that will shut the leader who is rigid down instantly. Um, so it's an opportunity to manage up. Collectivism, greater number and voices, helps people to understand the importance. And especially in a crisis, if the leader's not yielding the result he or she desires, this may be a wonderful time to get them to think of things in a different way. Oh, thank you for that. That's going to, I think, help a lot of people know what directions to take before they attack solutions. First, how to work within the group that they have and within the framework. Thank you. Lakeisha, you're up. And for you, I'd like you to respond to this quote from Ursula Burns. I realized I was more convincing to myself and to the people who were listening when I actually said what I thought versus what I thought people wanted to hear me say. Your thoughts? I love what you said, I'm more convincing to myself. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, when, when you were reading, I 
immediately thought about like actively listening. Like a lot of leaders are wondering like what to do in the time of crisis. The first thing you need to do is listen. Um, sometimes coming off with a solution sounds like you're not listening. So, and you're only listening to yourself. So it's very important as a leader that you actively listen and you listen authentically. A lot of times as leaders, we encounter so many people all day, every day, and some of them are quick and some of them are not so quick, but we have to um, honor each encounter, honor each encounter and listen and, and use it as um, an assessment of what needs to happen, what is happening and what you can do to influence what's happening. So I would say um, a lot of times uh, leaders get uh, overwhelmed. There's a lot of compliance things that need to happen. Um, there's, there's so much going on in a school at one time that sometimes it does. It gets really hard to really listen to your parents or listen to your teachers or when, when you're trying to make sure students um, have what they need. But um, just change your mindset about it um, and, and know that when you do listen to your, your community, that is helping your students. He brought up so many relevant points. I mean, compliance versus the idea of compassion. Um, and the constituents we have that have asked about that quite a bit, with a particular emphasis on how do you know who to prioritize listening to when all of the voices are coming directly for you. The person who is supposedly in charge and supposed to be able to make decisions on the fly, tough decisions, painful decisions, and yet everybody wants you to make them and everybody's interests may be competing. Wow. How in the world do you decide which voices and how and when to prioritize, particularly when there's a crisis, when you're in the midst of a crisis? Yeah, well, well some leaders are not gonna like what I'm about to say, but everybody's a priority. You are the leader of a full community and you are looked upon as the person of highest influence just because of your formal position. So everybody's high priority. The difference is, is that you have to filter through those priorities. So who can I delegate this to? Um, can I defer this for a moment? Can, can I um, deal with this right now? So deal, defer, and delegate. So when it comes in, I listen, I prioritize it, but then I take and filter it out because you're right. I'm only one person. As a leader, I cannot handle anything, but guess what? my community expects me to, and, and they should, because that is part of leadership. And so what I would say is make everybody a priority, but know how to prioritize things yourself and who to delegate to, who to, when to defer something, and when to deal with that thing immediately. I think that is a skill that has to be developed over time. But once that skill is developed, it will look like you're making everybody a priority. And that is very important to your community, for them to feel safe, for them to feel protected, and for them to feel like they have some sense of order. I think that this is going to be an interesting food for thought as far as a, maybe even a controversial one, thinking about the responsibility to answer to everyone that everyone is a priority. So I appreciate the way that you broke it down because you have to listen, but you need to understand that you have to deal, defer, and delegate. That's part of leadership. And there's really no way around it is what I'm hearing from you. Um, <laughs> Gail, can I add to that? Please do, yes. Keisha, I love the 3D concept. Um, it made me think about how when you decide what the priority is, I've seen a lot of leaders go to the people who have the biggest voice, the squeaky wheel are the persons who are taken care of first. And that's not necessarily what we wanna do in leadership. We want to make sure that everybody has a say and especially those people who don't. We want to prioritize the leader, the community members who are marginalized. Those who we usually don't think of first as a servant leader, that is the first go-to. So I love that, Lakeisha. Thank you, I just wanted to. Yeah, thank and, you so much. And to, to bounce back off of what Andrea said, it's, it's in the leadership actions as well. When I was a principal, um, I was a principal of a, a huge school in Virginia. And um, as soon as I became principal, one of the first things I did was visit the homes of my families. Um, it, 
it didn't matter their status or I just wanted to introduce myself and say hi. And that was so impactful. I still had parents talking about that at the end of the year, how I was in their home and they were honored that I was in their home. So even though there's a pandemic and everything is um, virtual, there's still some ways that you can connect directly with your community. And you don't have to visit everyone. It, it doesn't have to be where you have to make a goal to visit every um, home. Because honestly, parents talk. They're going to say, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so has been right. in my house. <laughs> and, and, and it's the symbolic representation that I'm not just a leader. I am part of the community as well. And I'm in this community with you. And we're going to work together. So your behaviors also um, show who you prioritize. 100% agree. Thank you both. I'm hearing a lot of servant leadership in there. A lot of servant leadership a lot of belief in relying on the expertise of others, sharing responsibility, so that the expectations of what we can do can rise together. This is what I'm hearing, and um, this is what our constituents are, are asking us for, how to do the things that nobody's directing them to do. Um, everybody's pretty much worried about access, about t uh, technology access, about the curriculum getting to be finished, what are teachers doing, and compliance. And the questions that leaders are asking are far more about these interpersonal issues, these management style issues, and how to corral and lead a group that may or may not be interested in the same priorities at the same time. And then that, seeing that across multiple stakeholder groups. So with that, I'd really like to go into some of the very specific questions on those issues that our community members are grappling with. I'll pose the question straight to you and uh, allow you a chance to answer them. Um, let's start with a question about cultivating and maintaining stakeholder relations. And that particularly was about parents and families. So some of our, our leaders have said that one unexpected byproduct of this crisis, the pandemic, has been um, an increase in their awareness of what's going on with their families that they just hadn't had before. They had relied previously on teachers and staff being the conduit between families and the school, between school and families, and really didn't know necessarily what was going on unless it was a, a problem that rose, got to the level of um, the school principal. And really they, they weren't as aware of what was happening with students and what's actually being put in front of students. And so some of them have seen this as an unexpected opportunity where they, for them personally, have been able to not only get a better understanding of what's going on, but even establish relationships with families that they hadn't had before that were now benefiting the process of getting this, the work done. And they're worried about how they're going to maintain any of that without going back to business as usual once all of the same priorities and concerns now amplified by remote learning come into play in the fall. And they're, they're, they're fearful. Some of, some of the leaders have expressed a lot of fear about the loss of these unexpected gains that came out of this crisis. Do you have any words or thoughts that might steer them in a direction that could be helpful? Um. So I was a family and community engagement specialist for the district after I left the principalship. And one of the biggest things, Gail, I think that you mentioned was being able to help parents advocate and have a voice in the conversation. So one way that you can ensure that the gains won't be lost is by continuing to build community and relationship. What are we going to do, especially at this time as parents are serving as co-teachers in a lot of cases, what are we going to do, not just one time, but on a consistently regular basis to ensure our parents are equipped with the additional skills they need and instruction, but also socially, emotionally, to support their students while they're home? As a leader, how am I going to make time in the crazy schedule, which has gotten even crazier during this time, during this pandemic, to pull my parents together and have a conversation to hear from them? Not necessarily always give what needs to be done, but listen. As Keisha mentioned earlier, active listening is super important. 
listen to their needs and the services that they want during this period so that we can ensure that they are set up for success as much as possible uh, with the kids in their home who are now not only their children, but their students in a lot of respects. Uh, one of the other ways is ensuring that the parents who are the super flyers, I call them, our parents who have the touch point with other members of the community are looped into the conversation to continue to carry the message in a grassroots effort. Keisha mentioned earlier, and I totally agree, as a leader, you cannot do this job alone. So empowering and equipping your parents to be able to mobilize and support in your absence, the continued work, I think will help leaders push for the, the continuation of success they've already started to feel. Thank you. It's, it's so insightful and it's going to help a lot of people. And I'd love to, along those lines and talking about the school community, turn to thinking just about teachers for a moment um, who were really at the front lines of a, a lot of the biggest confusion um, initially when we shifted to um, remote learning when few schools had plans in place and the teachers were sort of just doing you know, uh, improving it and slowly the schools began to build plans. I know from my own school district with my kids, I would say we still haven't quite reached um, a full plan for the fall, but they were winging it as best they could with the teachers at the helm. Um, and I think a lot of discoveries were made about the capacity of teachers. Teachers were now working late nights, uh, unions were getting involved, teachers now are having a, a a lot of uh, doubt, understandably so, about being forced to come back to school in the fall and not feeling that schools are prepared for that, certainly not that they're prepared for it just yet. And there's a lot of, um, un we don't really know what to expect for the fall, what it's going to look like, and it's certainly not even across the nation. So if you think about what that means, um, there's a lot of teacher need when we talk about what constituents are going to be coming to you. And I wonder if you can weigh in on the issue of trauma caused by COVID, caused by the overt racism and hate, its impact on the school community and instruction, as far as your teachers, your teaching staff, instructional staff are concerned, their various needs, fears, and expectations as well. How do you as a leader um, think about maintaining a culture of equity and rigor under this virtual spotlight with teachers who really have their own particular sets of concerns and fears around all of it? Do you have any thoughts for us or some wisdom? Because I think that's a big concern for the leaders in our community. That's such a great question, Gail. I think one of the things that we have to do is let the teachers that we support know that we are actually there with them. The same fears and uncertainty that they are experiencing, the same trepidation are, is a lot of times what the leader is also experiencing in that moment. And how we can share that authentically and transparently, that we are also afraid. We don't have all the answers. Leadership is not about knowing all the answers. It's actually the opposite. It's not knowing the answers, but knowing how to blaze the trail to get people where they need to be so that the answers can be fulfilled. So I think having open and honest conversations, making space to acknowledge some of the shortcomings, because this is a pandemic, two pandemics really, but the inequities that have, pervased, have prevailed in education have been here since the beginning of education, especially for people of color. So naming that up front and having a courageous conversation, if you will, about what that looks like for us as we educate students in a virtual environment. It is even harder to ensure our kids are getting what they need. They're able to stay online, build up their stamina for this type of instruction. How do we provide small groups? Having, I love what Keisha said earlier, having the members of your community who have served not only in teaching, but in other areas also weigh in will help to figure out this next step for all of us. This is unprecedented times and we do not have all of the answers. And I think that is very, important to let people know up front, I'm going to do as much as I can, as best as I can, but I need you to be on board with me so that we can continue this journey um, together because it is a journey. Yeah, Ooh, this, this, these two pandemics, <laughs> the, mm -hmm. the health pandemic and the uh, racism pandemic have been really taxing on all of our 
um, teachers and um, our, our CEO, she just did a keynote at our virtual summit and just shameless plug. <laughs> We have a virtual summit. It is amazing. It's for all educators. It's virtual. And um, our next one is in August. So go to our website. But um, her, in her keynote, she talked about eight, the eight minutes that George Floyd was under the knee of a white police officer. And she said eight minutes. And I was like, what, what does that symbolize? Why is she saying that when it comes to education? And it's, it symbolizes the urgency. That's one thing that I never understood, even when I was a principal, is the lack of urgency for equity and um, anti-racist education for our kids. There's a lack of urgency for it. And so one thing that this, these two pandemics have done is put that urgency in our face. Like, you can't, you can't hide from it. Like, the urgency is there. And we have to recognize that it's not just there for our students and our parents, it's there for our teachers. Our teachers need to experience anti-racism from their leaders. They need to experience the urgency from their leaders that they care about them. And that, you know, you're not looking at me as just a, a means to your end or, or, or as a machine that you can just manipulate. So I would say to leaders, yes, compliance is good, yes, um, policy procedures, schooling has to happen, curriculum is important. Yes, yes, absolutely. But when do you just take the time to just have a conversation with your teachers and say, how are y'all feeling? <laughs> when do you do it? When do you do it? They're people, they're human. They have so many, many things going on outside of their job. You have to care about your teachers. So many principals forget that they were teachers too. Um, if you remember being a teacher and you remember being under a principal, what were your experiences? Probably some of the teachers you have are probably experienced some of those experiences um, themselves. So I would say as a leader to deal with what's happening in our society um, is to also know that it's a microcosm of what's happening in your school. and. Mm -hmm. You have to do, um, like I said before, you have to listen, but also you have to set up the structure so that teachers can have an opportunity to voice their opinion and you can have an opportunity to advocate for them, to help them, to support them, create those opportunities. Everything is not about uh, schooling because people come first. People come first and your teachers should come first because they're the ones, they're the boots on the ground working with the students. Another point, Keish, that I was thinking about when you said that um, with the George Floyd incident and, and Lacey Robinson's keynote around eight, eight in a spiritual realm is a number for new beginnings. Mm. So it's an opportunity for us to have a new beginning as leaders. Are we equipping our teachers with the right materials? Because you're right, in a virtual environment, we want to make sure we're set up for success, but it can't be business as usual, as you said earlier. We have to do things differently. So I know it's a shameless plug to piggyback on Lakeisha's, but one of the things I love most, and I've heard from colleagues who've attended uh, not only our summit, but our, also our Standards Institute, is how we help to break down what are the most important pieces of instruction that we want to ensure kids grapple with every single day. So how do we prior, prioritize what's happening in the standards to make sure that we pull these things out of the curriculum that we put in front of our kids to give them the biggest bang for their buck in this shortened time frame, um, because I pray no district is having kids sit for eight hours on end in front of a computer all day. Um, it may happen, but it's highly unlikely that it will be as successful as you intend. So what do you do to streamline your approach? and support your teachers in getting the right materials. And as Keisha said, resources aren't always about money. There are a lot of free, open education resources that are greenlit quarterly curriculum that can be used at this time. Yeah. And one last thing before the next question, I just wanna say really quickly, and Andrea, you, you talking about um, that connection uh, to leader to teacher makes me think about this. Like, um, as a leader, what have I done to um, gain my teacher's trust. Like, teachers have been teaching virtually. As a principal, have you tried to teach a class virtually? <laughs> like, have you stepped into your teacher's shoes in this new way of learning to understand 
their needs, but it's one thing to listen, it's another thing to experience. Mm -hmm. So I will also encourage leaders to take the time to try to teach lessons online. So using the curriculum that your teachers are using, so you can just understand the, the things they have to go through and um, the challenges and also the wonderful things that are coming out of um, this way of learning. It'll build that cognitive empathy and it'll also give you some street cred, like, oh, really? Oh, you can do this too, yeah, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> totally. I love that. Too. That's true. We did get some feedback that, that praise and appreciation for how hard the work is goes a long way with teachers. And some leaders have found that when they've exercised that instead of pulling back. But speaking of doubling down under stress, some leaders and teachers are asking, you know, is it fair and realistic to expect teachers to think about equity and even to, to be rigorous about student assessment at right now? Is that even realistic? Is it even fair? Isn't it unfair to the students actually to ask much of them when under this virtual spotlight? You know, is that really something we should do, can do, ought to do in this time? something that we should have been doing all along. And I believe it's absolutely fair to provide kids with the best quality education that they could possibly get, even in a virtual setting. And for our students who are traditionally marginalized, our students of color, black, brown, Latina, Asian students, this is a great time to show them, we know that we have failed you in the past and we are going to do something different. I believe it was Winston Churchill who said, never let a good crisis go to waste. So if it is unfair at this time, when do we do it? When do we stand up and say, okay, enough is enough. We are going to change our policies, our practices, our way of being and doing so that we are doing something different to support not only the kids who are affluent or the kids who look may look like me and power if I'm a white teacher, but all the kids that I serve. How do I ensure every child is getting access to equitable instruction? That is what's fair which is a great, great segue to a major, major question that we keep getting. And that's about trying to affect culture change amidst, especially radical culture change, which might be what you're talking about, depending on where you are, when you have the same people, not necessarily a new mindset outside of yourself um, or your circle of people who you know will really be on board with any new push that benefits students and families. But you still are in the same setting and yet you might come in with a radical new idea of how to drive things forward in a way that lifts up those who need it the most. That's a tough space to be in when you've got tried and true sort of folks who have held it up and up till this point but now are being asked to do more and in most cases to do better. Particularly when we're talking about students who are the most marginalized, the most vulnerable, who previously were still the same, but maybe now it, more, it might be even more amplified. Where do you begin trying to change culture when you have the same people who may or may not be on board or who may be at different areas on the spectrum of agreeing with a culture shift? Yeah, I think... Um... I think if you are moving into um, new requirements or you want everybody to do better, uh, some call it continuous improvement, um, and you have the same people, um, the question is you have to evaluate your relationship um, with them and the culture that they have created, that you have created as a leader with them. Because I think this is a tricky question because depending on that, depending on the relationship and the culture you've built, um, that, will, that will inform you of how to um, get your people on board to something new, for something new. Um, I was a principal right when Common Core first came out, and I was the only principal in my district who was asked to go with central office to New York to learn about um, Common Core, literally when it, it first came out, no other principal in my district even knew what it was. And so when I uh, came back from that trip, my sense of urgency was heightened and I did two things. Um, the first thing I did was 
um, to call a forum of other principals in my district and talk about what I've learned just so they can be informed. <laughs> and then um, another thing I did internally with my own teachers was to present them with this and then ask them what they thought. Like I presented it as, as something I needed help. Like as, as leaders, we have to humble ourselves and say, guess what? To our staff, like, I need your help. Um, something new is coming. This is what it is. How can, and, and we know this is good for our students. How can we work together to do this? I don't know. Let's just throw some thoughts out there. And for some leaders, that's very scary, right? <laughs> you don't know what your teachers are going to say or how they're going to react or, or if they're going to be angry. But if you take a humbling stance with anything coming new, I think that is the beginning of trying to um, trying to get the people that are already with you on board with something new. And the relationship is so important. Um, if I have a relationship with my teachers, it really doesn't matter what I bring with them. They're going to be in it with me. We're going to huddle. We're going to figure it out and we're going to do it. So if you do not have that relationship with um, some of your people on, on your staff, that's one thing. Um, I think that's different when you have like a few people who are not on board, like that's different. But if you have a whole school that's not on board with something new, um, that is going to be a, a very big challenge for you because you do have to think about like quick wins. Like what is a quick win that I could give my staff around this that can um, get the ball rolling to cause them to trust that trust the process and trust that we're um, going through this. What are some things we can do in professional development? Maybe some teamwork, some team activity, maybe some um, troubleshooting activities that we can do to together. And your visibility in these times are so important. So attend all of those collaborative planning meetings. Um, don't let it, that's your priority. Attend, attend the profession. I, I've known as a, a principal mentor, so many principals who never attend collaborative planning meetings. I think that's where the, that's where the magic happens. So you want to be in those meetings. You want to um, meet with your teachers one-on-one because -on -one you want to know what each and every person um, has to say about the new idea. So you have to step in and, and be very visible and very humble and um, work together with your teachers when it comes to introducing something new to your staff who um, has already probably been, been traumatized by new stuff over and over again. But as long as they trust you as the leader, they'll be willing to, to go through whatever. Teachers, you were explaining. I was sitting here like, oh, I did that as a principal. I hope some of my former staff actually see this video <laughs> so they can validate like, oh, yeah, we did that, especially <laughs> around the attending the collaborative planning. What you're mm -hmm. naming, the practices that Lakeisha is using and naming reminds me of my leadership Bible, if you will. Um, when I was a part of the cohort for New Leaders Principal, we, I lived and breathed by the Leadership Challenge by Coons and Posner's. And their five principles um look I'm impressed. Did you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> but those principles are exactly the practices that you just named. And so if you are a leader and you are looking for a way to build your skill set, um, hopefully not in isolation. Like Keisha said, you have a cohort or community of other principles where you can lean on. If you want some great resources that are timeless, uh, please visit that book, The Leadership Challenge, because it will give you application and practice and ways that you can use to mobilize the community of teachers who may have been there previously, um, but may not be on board. And I'll just give one more example. Um, I think that uh, goes along with what Lakeisha was sharing, is doing a skill will assessment. So taking a look at your staff who've been there, and if you know them because they've been there, who is it on your staff that has the skill to implement this new idea and the will to implement it? Those are the people that I wanna corral first to bring together so that I can help them delegate some of the additional supports and resources to the larger staff. Who are the people on my staff? They may have the skill, but not necessarily the will. I, as a leader, I'm gonna have a conversation directly with those people and explain, like Keisha said, why I need you on board, how this is going to help impact us as a totality uh, as we move forward in this time of crisis. And if there are people on my staff who don't have the skill and or the will, this is a mandate. It is not an opportunity. So let's have a conversation about what is it going to take for you to then get on board because this is not 
this is what's best for kids. This is not something that we can uh, necessarily negotiate around. I'm willing to listen how I can support you, but it's a non-negotiable. So I would just use the skill will matrix too to help support the planning for your staff. So here we have the benefit of hearing the perspectives of two women in positions of power who are also black. And that certainly has got to implicate and have implications for your approach, um, what it brings to bear on what you know and believe, and also how you enact what you do. It's a very important lens. I mean, it's a, it's a lens that is personal for me, but also for a host of leaders in our community as they grapple with, sometimes for the first time, the problem of having what's going on outside the school not be able to, for us to pretend that it's not also uh, happening in the school, that it's not also reflected there because school is not in a vacuum. It never has been, but right now, no one can ignore it as easily. So from your perspective, as black women who lead, what are some of the ways that your identity um, and the racial identity of any leader right now, since we have leaders of all kinds, but what are some of the, the things that we leaders, white leaders, leaders of color, women leaders, men leaders, leaders who are in positions of, of uh, power right now and influence over many stakeholders who have different needs and different priorities. But can you speak to the experience that you've had where that has come to bear on your decision making and has helped perhaps, you know, had other implications for what you were trying to do and what you would advise leaders on how to handle matters of race now in their buildings can come up at any time and they are coming up. Yeah, this this is definitely like a personal, <laughs> a personal thing, like leading while black, right? Especially mm -hmm. leading while being a black woman. Yeah. Um, well, I, I do know from statistically and research wise that um, people don't really, don't really um, like being under an, a black leader, whether they're black or any other race they treat black leadership differently like this is well researched a black leader is going to be mistrusted a lot um they're going to be questioned a lot um and and it comes from both black people and uh people from other races so it's not just um it's it's a problem within our community and outside of our community the lack of um trust and respect for a black leader. So I, I just want to say that. And, um, but I also want to say that um, just because that is true, it doesn't mean that it's impossible. Um, I think as a black leader, it was my, it's my responsibility to um, ensure that I advocate not just for my community, but for myself. Um, when I felt, um, you know, something wasn't right, to voice my opinion, to um, continue the conversation. Um, but but being, being a Black leader can be exhausting, to be honest. It could be an exhausting thing. And that's why, um, you know, I always encourage leaders to do things to um, protect their mental and emotional health, because sometimes it really does um, take a toll on, on what you do. But my why is greater than all of that. As, as a black leader, like my why is greater than all of those challenges. Like my passion for children is greater than all of those challenges. And so I have to constantly go back to my why in order to continue to fight for justice for my community and to advocate for myself and take um, some risks that may um, have me be perceived as some type of way. So. Being a, a, a black leader is challenging, but it's also rewarding. I remember as a principal um, being being instrumental in getting free breakfast for my entire school and not just for the kids. Like teachers can eat free breakfast and everything. And I remember the first day that I was able to get that for my school, I started crying. I started crying because I could remember all the previous years where I had students cry because they were hungry. They couldn't concentrate in class because they were hungry. 
Um, so to have everybody eat and be ready to learn was monumental for me. So I hold on to those memories and I hold on to um, that, that feeling that I had something to do with bettering my community to be the best leader that I can be despite any of those challenges. When you said about being a black leader and the exhaustion is so real, how we continue to maintain and push forward, even in the face of a crisis, like what we're experiencing is key. And now it was, it was a different crisis um, when I was a principal, it was a crisis of getting kids educated in school, off the streets, out of gangs, but it was still, it was a pandemic within itself. And having teachers who were older than me, who were a different color or nationality than me, different gender than me, did lead to some courageous conversations. I'm with you, Lakeisha. There were opportunities for me to help people realize that just because you've been here as long as the school building doesn't mean that I don't have the expertise and the, the knowledge to help push this school forward. So I think that comes through time and consistency. What you do over a course of time and how consistent you are in your communications and your actions so people begin to see and believe that you are about what you say and not just because you say it, but they see you living it and doing it. And that's how I try to live my entire life, by living what I believe and speaking my truth in a way, as Lacey added to Glenn Singleton's uh, Courageous Conversation Agreement, speaking your truth with mercy. Because we have different walks and we have different backgrounds and experiences, but I'm, wi I'm willing to extend you the same grace that I am asking of you as a leader in this situation. So it has to be a two-way street in communication. Will everybody be on board? Absolutely not. Back to Jim Collins, find another seat on another bus if this isn't right for you. And that's real talk. Super insightful because the research shows about Black women school leaders and teachers that they often find themselves in a position of buffering institutional pressures that have embedded systemic racism in it while on the other side sort of protecting the people in the, the building, particularly the students, students of color who are marginalized from those same systems that they themselves are bearing the burden of at the same time. So it's a unique position to be in. And it means that black women leaders have special insights that really should be seen as, as valuable. And um, while they are resources in their own right, black women leaders, it also can lead to um, fatigue and burnout from sometimes feeling like you're, you're the hamster in the wheel at the same time with all of the um, disparate interests and not being able to yet move the system. So that's why it's so important for us to listen to your sources of where that inspiration still comes from. And from what I'm hearing, it's strong belief in purpose at, about the work at hand. It's strong belief in self as a, as a leader with a vision that you believe is right, but it's malleability with um, other people and their expertise around you and partnering, collaborating, but with an eye toward what's, what's best for students and trying to always improve upon it. And what I think um, that means is that you must have some way of thinking about how you have to be sustained. So I'd like to give you a sentence and it would be i think very helpful for all of us if you would finish the statement fill in the blank with your um answer to it what has sustained me or sustains me as a leader when i face my own lowest moments burnout self-doubt confusion or disappointment has been blank. My spirituality, for me, um, when I get to my lowest place and I have nothing left in my reserve, I've poured out everything for everyone else and I need a replenishment, I go to a higher power. I find comfort and belief in knowing the word that I stand on, like Lakeisha said, is not just for this moment, but for my life. I think back to being a teacher, but I also think back to when I was a student. I was a student in the very same system that I chose to serve in because I wanted to make a difference in the way someone made a difference in my life. And so I'm gonna just share an, uh, a quote that I keep with me. 
Uh, do not be worried in well-doing, for in due season you will reap your harvest if you faint not. It gets hard, but you have to have time to give yourself some grace and make sure that you keep moving forward. And whenever I get stuck, that is where I go. Back to my spirituality. That, has that um, changed as your work has changed or has that held true? Oh, it's evolved and grown as my work has changed. I've, I found myself relying more on what I know to be true within myself and self-centered and helping to filter the world through that lens. I had a principal colleague when I was uh, in the district say, oh, I didn't know this job was going to be like this. I never prayed before. I said, but I bet you do now. Because it really takes something higher, a higher power, and whatever that power may be for you as an individual, as a leader, please find it so that you have something to pour back into yourself when you have nothing left to give. Your kids need you, your teachers need you, your community needs you, but they can't be there for you if you don't, you can't be there for them if you don't have anything left within you. So please continue to make sure you lean in on that higher power. I know it sustains me and it gets me through. And as I've grown in my leadership journey through various positions, I just find I rely on it more. And it builds my confidence in knowing that what I'm doing is authentically what I believe the right thing is to do. Do you feel you're being used, Andrea, for for something greater than what we think we see in front of us? 100%, Gail. Uh, Anyone in education, I think, will probably... I shouldn't say anyone. Most people would believe it's a calling. I'm called to serve. And this is the capacity in which I find the most joy in serving. I find the most struggle in serving because I want to make changes to things that I see and I can't necessarily do it in that moment, but I'm going to continue to push forward, like eradicating racism in schools and dismantling the systems that perpetuate it. That is something that I know is a part of my calling and why I feel such joy and fulfillment in this job like I've never felt in my entire life. Because it's not just about talking or saying on a piece of paper, hey, we're going to do this. We actually, as an organization, live it internally and externally. And I believe it is definitely a calling and I'm blessed to be able to do it. Thank you for sharing that. Keisha, do you want to respond? Can I read the quote for you again? The sentence? What has sustained me or still sustains me as a leader when I face my own lowest moments, burnout, self-doubt, confusion, or disappointment is? Um, Definitely my um, spirituality. Um, Like Andrea said, like I I feel like I have to be... um, I have to always be rooted and grounded in my strong belief that um, what I'm doing is not out of my own strength, but out of the strength of a higher power. And that allows me to lean on that higher power when I'm stressed out, burned out, um, questioning myself as a leader. I, I lean on that. I also lean on my past. Um, I I am my students. I grew up very impoverished. Um, a lot of struggles, um, faced a lot of nights without um, having food on my plate, um, struggling to just live and have clothes on my back and and struggling with the obstacles that all come with living in um, marginalized communities. I was that student. So when I get burnt out and tired, though that thing within me is so deep, like it's personal, like it's a personal thing that allows me to come up out of it every time because I get burnt out and I get tired all the time but all the time I come out of it and it is because I feel that if I don't do this like I shouldn't be existing like my life has been on this trajectory since I was a little kid walk I remember walking a little girl that lived in an apartment next to me to school every day trying to protect her from the gangs that were around and so I've always had that inside of me just to protect protect children and um and so just remembering where I came from and where I am is like and that's a miracle from God right there because I know for sure I'm not supposed to be here it wasn't the plan and so that 
that keeps me going. Like when I see the mission and vision of our organization at Unbounded, like I am the mission and vision. Mm -hmm. I am the hope. I I am what's supposed to be happening to these children, you know? So, um, you know, I, I am the one that grew up in a marginalized school where I felt like none of the teachers cared about me, but some way I made it to this point where I am in the position to ensure that students don't ever have to go through what I went through as a child. Like I am the mission and vision. And so um, that deep inside me really helps me come out of those ruts um, that I get in. And lastly, just creating boundaries for myself. Like I had to learn the self-importance of me. <laughs> Being like, because I'm not just a leader. I'm like a mom. I'm a wife. I am a sister. I'm a daughter. And I get pulled on in my personal life um, because leadership doesn't stop at school. You, most leaders that are leaders at school, they're leaders at home too. And so how do you protect yourself? You create boundaries. You create rooms like this. This is not my daughter's room, okay? This is my room. This is my space. Nobody comes in here. So leaders, you are working from home. <laughs> You are working from home. You're constantly on calls and constantly on computers. I would encourage you to create a boundary in your home where you can just have a, a, a space to yourself. Create it. I don't care if it's a little corner. Just create a space for yourself because mentally it becomes taxing. Um, during this pandemic, even though I'm home more, it's like I'm working more. I don't know how that happened. I'm home more and working more. But that's how it feels. And so you do need like a look away moment. You need a place where you can go to meditate, a place where you can go to pray and, and, and center yourself. You need outlets. You need to be able to join groups. Like I have joined so many Facebook groups <laughs> since I've been home just trying to connect with people. And so I would say to leaders, like, yes, school is your life, but you are, you are so much more than your school. You are who you are. And so nurture that person so that when you get burnt out, so that when you get tired, that you will have a place of release. You all have a lot to bring to advise all leaders, but I want to ask on behalf of some of the, the white leaders who um, are grappling with what to talk about particularly when they have never addressed issues of race or racism before and haven't expected teachers to, now they're being asked specifically to talk explicitly about the relationship of race and racism to their work, the work that happens in the schools, and also its impact on the relationships in the schools, teachers, students, parents, teachers, administrators, and um, teachers, it's it's alive and well and always has been, but now people are being asked to speak directly about it. And some of our white leaders are reaching out saying, I don't know even how to begin a, such a conversation. And I'm afraid, am I the one? Should I? And should I be the one to engage in a conversation about George Floyd? Should I even say how I feel? Do I have a right to feel anything? You know, what is it that, where do I belong in this debate? Should I step back? Should, what do I do? Do you have any insights? Yes, there? I've actually said this to a whole school system one time is that as a black person, I want to hear the white voice. It is um, when there's a there's a silence that happens with white people when they have to um, face tough conversations like this and they just go quiet. And I just want to implore that we want to hear your voice, even if you're asking a question. Some of, the, some of the most great, courageous conversations have come out of a white person saying, Lakeisha, how, can, how am I supposed to approach this with you? Like, I, I, I don't know what to do. Like, but I need to hear your voice to sit and be silent and never talk about it. Never say George Floyd's name out of your mouth as a white person sends a strong message to me as a black person that you don't care enough to take the risk to say his name out your mouth. And so I feel strongly that as a white person, you have to be courageous. <laughs> if you're in a school full of people of color, that you not only listen, but also talk. Start with questioning. If you don't know what to say, everybody can start with a question. Start with the question or start with I statements like I feel 
horrible. Like start with an I statement, but don't just sit there and be quiet because that is to me the most offensive thing that you can do. And the, the best thing you can do is, is voice your opinion and, and stand up. Um, when, when I had, um, I've, I faced a, a racist inst incident myself one time. And when I had a white person stand up and advocate for me, oh, I've never had that before. That was a new experience, but it felt so darn good. <laughs> it's like, I don't have to do it anymore. I'm so tired of doing it. And I have my white, you know, friend, I call him friend now, friend standing up for me. Oh, that means so much. So to all of our white advocates, partners, friends, like Rihanna said, I don't know if anybody heard her, but she was like, ask your friends to pull up. <laughs> like to my white friends, to my white colleagues, to my white leaders, pull up, pull up and say something. That's what we need as people of color. That's what we need. So, Andrew. I'm with you. <laughs> no, Lakeisha, you, you said it all. I'm totally in agreement with you because if you are silent, then you're in agreement with the current situation and the status quo and that if you really support the mission and vision you will stand up and say that you know this is not right we have to do something different racism is real how do we help support the conversation and a lot of times from some of my white colleagues and friends i hear the conversations that they have with other white people and they can say things to their white colleagues that wouldn't be received by me in support of the mission so to lakeisha's point please stand up please do your best to say in an authentic way you're going to make mistakes you will not have all of the answers again back to true leadership but be transparent and let it be known up front i'm going to mess up i may not have all of the answers but i am going to get some resources like glenn singleton's courageous conversations book and lean in on those four agreements find someone who you can have the conversation with across the aisle a person another person who is in your circle that is black, that is Latina, that is uh, a person who is of a different age group and, uh, and like find people who are diverse and not necessarily fitting within your comfort um, or your circle. Expand your reach because if you don't, you'll say I'm for it and I'm about it, but your walk won't show it and people will see it. And, and at Unbounded, we, have, we do have a free resource called the Bias Toolkit that can help you start that conversation at your school. It's free, it's on the website, you can go there right now and, and download it. And that can be something like a tool or an anchor for you to start the conversation with um, your colleagues and friends as well. Absolutely, but as a white leader, please do not use the anti-bias toolkit for your black colleagues to lead. You are the leader, we need to have you at the helm of the conversation. Everybody wants to hear what you have to say. So please make sure you pray about it or whatever power you go to as a source and then do it in service of the kids that we all want to see grow and succeed. As you said earlier, it's the responsibility of the leader to prioritize everyone, right? So this is, this would be, this is why we want to have that conversation. It is, it is not just about what happens in the building. It's about your your space and what happens around it. There's so many elements going on that so many of us don't even really understand who are in your position, you know, who are not in your position. So thank you for your transparency and your openness about identity and belief and how that, like it or not, it plays into everything that we do. So thank you so much for, for sharing with us and teaching us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.